people are part of nature. We can either protect it or can become its biggest enemy. How do we maintain the natural balance in the age of global urbanization? What do we know about the wild inhabitants of forests, steppes and mountains of Kazakhstan? We'll talk about the nature, find out incredible details of life of plants and animals of Kazakhstan, reflect on the place humanity occupies in the world. All of it in the television project Talk to Nature. This land is called Jetisu, Semirechia, the land of seven rivers. That's how many rivers flow into Balhash. The largest of them are Karatal, Koksu, Lepsi and Deli. Not a single one flows out of Balhash. The fact that half of the water in Balhash is saline and half is fresh makes it a pretty unique lake. The waters are divided by a narrow strait. The area of the lake is 16,000 kilometers. It is stretched across three administrative regions – Almaty, Karaganda and Jambil. This is the largest lake in Kazakhstan. We are at the delta of the Eli River, the vast territory of the largest river feeding Lake Balhash. The delta acts as a natural regulator, sharing the water it saves with the lake during the dry period. To our right there is the dry bed of Bakanas, one of the oldest leaves of the Eli River, once flowing into the lake, which indicates that the river can easily change its path in the sandy landscape. Finally, after six hours' drive and an hour by boat, we arrived at Bayaral, 12 kilometers from Balhash. This is where we are going to stay and learn about the beauties of the Balhash region. Many people wonder why the water in these channels and small lakes is so pristine and clear. The Li River begins in China, in the western Tian Shan. The water in the stretch is dark and cloudy like coffee with cream. To reach this place, the water passes through dozens of large and tiny lakes. Passing through the reeds and thick algae, the current slows down, filtering out the particles. That's why fishes from all over Kazakhstan and beyond are drawn to this delta. It's worth noting that their catch is highly valued, and catfish hunters from Europe live proud of their royal trophies. We geared up, took our flippers, masks, underwater cameras and wetsuits, ready to watch the underwater world right at this spot. I'm wearing a wetsuit. Today we have a test swim. We'll see what's in here and then we'll tell you. Let's check it out. The ichthyologists believe that the photo base of the lake is extremely rich and we can see why. The fish seems to flourish here. The wheat thickets are teeming with life. Ubiquitous fry chases one another. All the fish seem more cautious but can't refuse a treat in form of a corn all the same. As for large fish, they hide and remain still rarely moving the gills under the kupax. That's how locals refer to the floating islets of reeds. Noticing such fish is a tricky thing, especially for an unexpected guest. Underwater predators usually go on their hunt at night time. I've been swimming about 15 minutes and I can say that there are a lot of fish here. I saw a wobbler, a crucian carp, a common carp and a grass carp. But I didn't see any catfish or snake heads. The water is clean, the lake is very densely populated. The average depth is about 3 meters, you can see as far as 5 meters away. The current is hardly noticeable, but the algae entangle the flipper so tight that sometimes it gets hard to continue swimming. It almost forces you to crawl on the surface. But would this stop an inveterate diver? Oh, 
Вот это типичный балхашский сазанчик. Небольшая особь около трех. Here's our first trophy, a common cup of Balhash. This particular specimen is about three years old. It's a fresh water fish living mainly in rivers. What is the difference between the river one and that living in the lake? Cups from lakes are darker in color and little fatter, while the river ones are long, swift like a torpedo and lighter colored. I assume this one weighs about 700-800 grams. I think that fish inhabiting this area are gaining such good weight thanks to the flora, the algae that grow here. The sun sets and we are returning to the camp. Despite the fact that the camping site is deep in the desert, far away from civilization, every guest, no matter the status, will find this location exquisite. We are in the lower reaches of Balhash. One of the channels flowing into the lake, in fact, is an island, with water running on one side and endless swamps on another. I see that the reefs there almost reach the horizon. People elevated the ground level by one and a half meters, built little houses and even organized a park. I was amazed seeing different trees here. Thuja spirea, Chinese willow is thriving here as well, growing next to local species. This tree over here is called silverberry, locally known as jida. Such small growth attracts birds and animals, creating its own microclimate. This is a great example of humans' cooperation with nature. Not only seedlings, all construction materials were delivered here by ferry. Local residents drive high-speed boats with such an ease, it's astonishing. Growing up here, they know every lake, every channel and passage in the labyrinth of lakes. On my way through the park, I came across this tree. It is a sea buckthorn, a cultivar I think of Ukrainian selection. But landscapers made a mistake. Buckthorn is planted in pairs, male and female tree. Apparently, that is why there are no berries on it. We were pleased by little botanical refinements during our walk through a tiny garden, something we couldn't have expected given that the Taukum Desert is right behind the corner. I was very much surprised to see this tree in the park. This is a catalpa, a delicate, gentle tree we mainly see in cities. And suddenly I see it growing here in extreme continental climate, on saline soil, seemingly well, even blooming. What a pleasant surprise! Someone got even bolder and planted fruit and berries on these salt marshes. I can see that golden currant is growing well here. I was also surprised to see cherry trees. Let's try it. Very tasty, fragrant berries, still a little sour though. There are no power lines in a 50-kilometer radius from here. Therefore, people are using alternative sources of energy. For instance, wind generators and a large solar battery generate about 4 kilowatts of power. This energy is enough for a small base like this, providing enough light, feeding refrigerators and even electric pumps that water our wonderful lawns and this small park. Reeds are regressive plants of the wetland environment and are everywhere around us. They are in its element here, the water is everywhere and there's nothing to be done about it. People have gone through all these troubles, but still the vegetables and fruits won't grow here even under professional care and in a carefully set greenhouse. 
fishing has been flourishing in Balhash since time immemorial. Many villagers from Kuigan and Karaoi depend on fishing for their living. There are large cooperatives, smaller fishing unions with iron launchers harvesting the Balhash fish with their huge trolls. Fishermen have a quota for the amount of the fish they catch. They have a signed fishing area and need to allocate certain sum from each kilogram of fish caught toward the restoration of fish stocks. Этим утром мы встретили рыбаков, промысловиков, рыбачащих в этих местах. In the morning, we met fishermen. They only catch predatory fish. Let's see what they got today. Here are catfish and snake heads. There was plenty of this fish 10 years ago already. There were devastating forecasts when this fish was first introduced to Balhash. People were afraid that catfish will eat up everything. It's a terrible predator, and there is no salvation against it. But there are similar concerns about the snake head. However, in my opinion, it's a tasty fish, therefore good. There it is, a typical snake head. It feeds on small fish and actively reproduces. It feeds on anything, even ducks and muskrat. Who eats more fish, catfish or snake heads? Snakeheads. The best season for fishing is in the spring and autumn. Locals know this perfectly well. As soon as the water warms up, the fish becomes active, comes out of algae and deep pits, and season begins. Today it's too hot and it hardly bites, but there's something. This fishing tackle is called a trot line. There are 50, maybe 80 hooks bent with notches. They make up the scene. The bait is hung on them and the tackle is checked next day early in the morning. Maybe one out of ten of those will leave fishermen happy. This is a Balhash catfish. Its bubbles are for sensing the smell and filling the objects around. Catfish tends to stay in deep waters, being active mainly in the night time. Judging by its color, it's a lake catfish. This one is dark, there are one or two lighter ones here too. It feeds on common carp, wobbler and loves crucian carps. As famous these places are as great fishing site, they are also known for mosquitoes bothering tourists, fishermen and local people on the lake. People say that during some years the bloodsuckers got so out of control that shepherds had to burn dry manure fuel all night next to the cattle pens to protect cows and younglings from horsefly and mosquito bites. These days, when packing for a trip like this, don't forget to take some repellents. In the morning, only spider webs will remind of the night attacks attempted by ill-fated insects. I'm interested in what nature-loving tourists take with them on trips these days. To reduce the harm to environment while outdoors, you need to reduce the use of fuel engines. Real travelers use renewable solar energy. Compact batteries are charged from dawn to dusk. Two light bulbs will light up a small tourist camp all night. It's impossible to imagine the life of a modern traveler without multiple gadgets. To improve the comfort during a hike like this, we use such portable solar stations. During the daytime, it charges this battery and we can use it in the evening. This way we'll have light in our tents at all times. The battery can be used to charge cameras, flashlights and indispensable communication equipment. In the 70s, the dam for the Kapchigai hydroelectric station was built upstream of the River Li. A fragile ecosystem was disturbed by this massive construction. A large artificial sea was formed. 
The water was held there for several years, leaving not enough water to feed Balhash. The quality of water in the lake deteriorated, and the lake itself grew shallow, reducing its area by 150 square kilometers. Fortunately, over the past decades, the situation changed for the better. There is more water than ever. Our small expedition is heading to the great water of Balhash. Experienced conductor Yurlan Mohambichiev knows a shortcut along the reed trails. Several decades ago, humanity lost the Aral Sea. This is a terrible lesson we had to learn. Right now, behind my back, you can see Lake Balhash stretching to the horizon. It seems like a self-sufficient ecosystem, very lively and stable. But in truth, it's very fragile since the depth of Lake Balhash is only six meters. If the water level falls to two or two and a half meters, this area will turn into a swamp. We must remember this. Up to the middle of the last century, the Turanga groves of the delta were inhabited by Turanian tigers, also known as Caspian tigers. This big cat preyed on wild boars, the population of which is still abundant in riparian forests and marshes. Many waterfowl nest in Balhash area. Black cormorants, fishermen least favored since they eat the fish caught in the nets. Numerous ducks, pelicans and even red-listed hooper swans. The great crested grebe doesn't fly away from the boat when they see one. They prefer to dive under it. The speed of reaction is excellent. Catching a glimpse of this bird on camera proved to be a tricky task. Here we found a poaching net. Poachers and negligent fishermen set up this kind of nets, even though this type is prohibited in Kazakhstan. Some people come back to pick them up, some simply leave them behind, meaning that the fish will keep being stuck in this net. Fish can get out of it and the net itself doesn't dissolve in the water. Unfortunately, if you fly above most of our water bodies on a helicopter, you'll notice that their floors are entangled in such nets, like with blood vessels. It quickly burns out under the sun, but in the water it's very durable. Mesh size number four. How many meters are there? About 200? Now this net can cause no harm to the fish. Licensed fishermen are allowed to use nylon thread, but not fishing line net. In the first half of the last century, there were three, four different fish species in the River Lee and Lake Balhash. Soviet ichthyologists figure out the capacity of the food base, justifying and releasing a dozen more species into the water system. Almost all new settlers have perfectly settled in, and that marked the beginning of fishing industry flourishing. There are about 10 different kinds of fish in this channel. Let's count together. Common carp, grass carp, vobla, crucian carp, catfish, snakeheads, there are also Volga Zander, a mixture of pike perch and perch, pike perches and big head cups. See, we've counted up to nine species already. That's how many species are found in Balhash. Let's see what we can catch. Which bait did you use? Corn. All three days spent in the elite delta were filled with impressions and memories. We shared them in the evenings when everyone was seated around the fire. Our friendly hosts would listen with attention, people who welcomed us so warmly and accompanied to the most exciting places. A wonderful region of Balhash, where you can endlessly race on a motorboat, uniting with the water element, stunned by the din of the bird flocks where humans are still rare visitors.
the land where you wish to come back to again and again. <laughs> <laughs>